believe this is in my mind all the time. We'll be starting in three minutes. I have a lot of curiosity about the history of African Americans in the story of what's happened to people post-slavery. How come some families find wealth and, and education and, and have success and some families don't? I'm curious about that. My father, John Dabney, middle height, good natured, reddish brown complexion, fat, rotund as a high liver should be, long black hair. If pop couldn't do it, it couldn't be done. When he told us of his early days, the stories grew longer as he grew older. From jockeydom, increased weight, had forced him from the saddle as it had his father and his brothers. The big house wanted him, and there he learned domestic duties. Sent away to work for himself, he gradually reached the hotel, still standing at the railroad station in Gordonsville. He was its head waiter when only 18 years of age. From Gordonsville to Richmond was but a step. Hotel employment offered a fine feel for tips so necessary for fattening his own purse. His advancement was rapid. Soon he was winning fresh laurels as the barkeeper of the exchange in Ballard, the leading hotel of Virginia's leading city. We'll be starting in one minute. My father attended to business. My mother looked after the house and raising of the children. She gave us most rigid training in the rules of etiquette, as exemplified in her girlhood days in the family of which she was a slave and relative. When Clarence was born, my mother, still a slave, was devoting more attention to her family than to her owners. Dissatisfaction at this and rapidly growing debts caused them to decide upon selling her. Pop had made a contract to buy himself and was keeping up his payments. Pop went to his owner and promised she would let him for a time discontinue his payments so that he could save his wife. He would certainly pay her every cent he owed for his own freedom. And she agreed. Then, with assistance from some of his white friends, he secured the money and bought my mother. Later on, the war being over and my father's former owner destitute, Pop went to see her and said, I owe you some money. No, John, she said. You owe me nothing now. The war has freed everybody. But Pop said that has nothing to do with my contract. I am keeping my word. And while she sat there bathed in tears, he laid $1,000 down on the table and walked out. Richmond never forgot the deed. My father's note was good at any bank and his word equivalent to an oath. Originally nine children, two had been taken by diphtheria by my time. And Clarence was the oldest. Kate was widely known as the Belle of Richmond. I was the fifth child, named for the celebrated abolitionist Wendell Phillips. Next in line came Milton, in the field of athletics, baseball, he reigned supreme. Hattie, the baby, the pet. She took everything she could get in the line of schooling and a con. Good afternoon to everyone. My name is Lorraine Justice, and I am the director of the Student Support Services Program. And we're going to now have our welcome by our president, Dr. Shannon Kennedy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Justice. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I've had an un unstable internet all day, so hopefully we can get this with, without um, breaking up on you. But thank you so much for joining us. This is our second Black History um, Month event, and we had a great discussion the last time, and um, this time we are so excited 
um, to hear from filmmakers and from Jenny um, uh, about the this film and this experience. So it's so much. Thank you so much for taking your time. And I see faculty, staff, and students that are, have joined for this discussion. So with that, uh, Joe Coleman, I'll turn it over to you, Joe, Joe, to talk about some Black History Month details. Mr. Coleman, you're on mute. Okay. <laughs> Thank he's, you, Dr. Peter. He's got it. We all, <laughs> There's a presentation, um, not a presentation without somebody being on mute. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Dr. Kennedy. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, say a few words about Black History Month. Black History Month is an annual celebration of achievements of African Americans and a time for recognizing their central role in the US and US history, also known as African American History Month. The event grew out of, out of Negro History Week the brainchild of noted historian Carter G. Woodson and other prominent African Americans. Since 1976, every U.S. president has officially designated the month of February as Black History Month. Other countries around the world, including Canada and the United Kingdom, also <laughs> devote a month to celebrating Black history. Um, I am uh, thrilled that, that this afternoon that we're here to talk about Mr. John Dabney. Um, Dabney, uh, imagine, if you will, being born enslaved where you are the property of another human being, that learning to read means you're equipped for, for learning. Imagine one day finding yourself free and trying to figure out how to make a living and a life for yourself. Later, you are serving dignitaries princes and politicians and your food and the, and your food and meals are known are now are now renowned that was the life of john dabney john dabney was a giant of, of 19th century richmond high society he was a fixture of sophisticated gatherings a connoisseur of the earth's delicacies turf and stew cabbage back duck hailstone mint juleps I saw the recipe for that. It looks pretty good. Maybe I can try that this summer. And a family <laughs> man with his, his wife. He raised five children. Among them, school teachers, a professional baseball player, and a musician turned newspaper editor. He was much admired. Each of Richmond's four daily newspapers noted his passing in 1900. Yet the man who helped Yet the man who had met the Prince of Wales and knew how to craft what the papers call immortal foods was also defined by what prevented him from doing even more. Dabney, an African-American, spent, spent his first 41 years enslaved. And, and I was looking at the movie uh, on yesterday. I, I just imagined how much more this, uh, this gentleman could have achieved if he would be allowed to be able to read and write. Uh, when he was younger, and some of the other things that he had to struggle with throughout his life, if he, if he didn't have to deal with that, how much more could he, he could have achieved. And so I'm very excited to so have this panel discussion today. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Miss uh, Miss Feeney with the uh, introductions of our speakers. Hello, everyone. Today we have Hannah Ayers and Lance Warren. They are Emmy-winning Mary documentary filmmakers working at the intersection of history and social justice. Their company, Phil Studio, has been based in Richmond since 2014. Their previous work includes an outrage about the history and legacy of lynching in the American South. In the CBS series, The Future of America's Past, which explores how artists, activists, and curators- And he wasn't present uh, for instruction. Uh, remember complex characters, chapters of American history. Their first feature length film, How the Monuments Came Down, premiered in the summer of 2021 and is available to stream on pbs.org. Please give a vir virtual welcome to Hannah Ayers and Lance Warren. Thank you. Hello, thank you for having us. Next we have Dr. Cassandra Newby-Alexander. 
Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander is a Dean at Norfolk State University. She received her BA from the University of Virginia and her PD PhD from the College of William and Mary. Since then, the Norfolk native have focused much of, of her research and writing on the history of African Americans in Virginia. Her publications have appeared in edited books and major biographical series such as the Dictionary of Virginia Biography. Her most recent publication, An African American History of the Civil War in Hampton Roads in 2010, recounts the fascinating history of the remarkable African American community <laughs> Civil War to Reconstruction. Her co-authored books, Black American Series, Portsmouth in 2003, and Hampton Roads, Remembering Our Schools in 2009, were the first to examine the history of American African Americans in Portsmouth and emergence of public schools in the Norfolk area. She also co-edited a book based on Democracy Conference held at Norfolk State University during the 400th anniversary of the nation's founding entitled Voices from Within the Veil, African Americans and Experience of Democracy in 2008. Currently, Dr. Newby Alexander has completed her work with two other historians on a city commissioned history of African Americans in Norfolk, Virginia entitled I Too and Am Norfolk. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Newby Alexander. Thank you so much. Our final guest speaker is Jennifer Hardy. She is the great great granddaughter to John Dabney. She grew up in New York and taught elementary education in the public schools of Brooklyn, New York. As a child, Hardy would visit her relatives in Norfolk, Virginia. Her father and her brothers grew up in Norfolk and her mother was a modern dancer at Martha, Martha Graham Company. Mrs. Mrs. Hardy comes from a very prestigious family which includes veterans, medical doctors, and hospital founders. Mr. Dabney will be a, be a proud of, of his family accomplishments. Mrs. Hardy is presently retired and living in Kentucky enjoying time with her husband and family and enjoying her love for horses. Please welcome Jennifer Hardy. Thank you. Thank you to the panel so much. So I'm gonna be asking you some questions um, and whoever wants to start can. So again, we're here to talk about um, black history and film. You know, we're gonna talk about the life and legacy of John Dabney. So when did you first learn of Mr. Dabney? And I guess I'll start with Hannah and Lance, please. Sure. sure, sure. Well, thank you so much for, for having us and for organizing this event. It's really special to um, have the chance to, to share this film and um, to, to be with the Hardys um, and Cassandra. Um, we first learned about John Dabney because there is a food festival here in Richmond called Fire, Flower, and Fork. Um, and the founders of that festival had read an article by a journalist named Robert Moss in Charleston, South Carolina. And he had mentioned in passing a, uh, a, a Richmond restaurateur and chef and caterer named John Dabney. And um, as food festival organizers, they were intrigued to, to learn more. So they really did a deep dive into learning who this, who this gentleman was, including researching whose uh, descendants might be in the area or might be able to visit. Um, so we had never attended the dinner, but we read about it and were so intrigued by just a little bit of um, nuggets of information that we read about John Dabney and we were eager to learn more ourselves and eager to see how could this be visualized in a film. Great. Dr. Newby Alexander, when did you learn about Dr. Regard Mr. Dabney? Um, you know, I encountered um, John Dabney actually through his son, uh, Wendell Dabney, who was a classmate of Sarah Garland Jones. This was an article that I uh, wrote and published in the Virginia Magazine of History and Biography in 2018. And I would say that was maybe about in 2014. Uh, when I was doing the research. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'll say this, you know, when it comes to researching and, and writing on African American history, you really have to be a detective. Every, everything about African Americans is scattered and it's piecemealed in different places because there was such an effort not to record 
the history of African Americans, not to catalog that history in the state papers and the libraries and museums. And, and only recently has there been another kind of uh, eye turned towards how museums and libraries have cataloged their information so that you can access this more directly. Fortunately, Wendell uh, Dabney was a newspaperman. Uh, he was a writer and um, and he, he decided he was going to write down his memories of his father. And, um, and so I did a deep dive into what he wrote about his father. And so this, this world that his father lived in, in, in Richmond, uh, really came alive through his writings. And that's how I learned a lot more about John Dabney and saw that he was in so many ways like many African Americans, especially African American men who, who uh, were enslaved, who lived in urban areas, who had opportunities because of their talents and abilities and the desire by their slaveholders uh, to make money from their talents and abilities. And, and a, a person who was fully evolved, who understood the world that he lived in, understood um, whites and, and how there was such fear uh, of, of strong, powerful, uh, knowledgeable African-American men, especially. Um, and he understood and knew how to navigate that world and became very successful in doing so, but also made sure that his children were successful. So um, that was kind of my journey in learning a lot more about John Dabney and the world in which he lived through the eyes and the voice of his son, Wendell. Thank you so much, Dr. Newby Alexander. Um, Ms. Hardy, you're the great, great granddaughter of Mr. Dabney. When did you learn about Mr. Dabney? Um, before I start, I just want to mention that my daughter is also joined, has joined us, Elsa Hardy. So she would be the great, great, great granddaughter of John Dabney. And she actually has studied uh, African American history um, in her post college work. Um, I first learned, I, I feel sort of ashamed to say so, but the organizers of the food festival in Richmond, Susan, uh, contact, she did a lot of detective work and found me through my school in Brooklyn, New York, somehow. I don't remember how. I tried to find her the original email, but I was not able to. Um, and she sort of laid out my family history to me. And I remember sitting after dismissal, reading this email and my jaw dropping. And I was just so amazed. And it was just such a wonderful event that happened uh, because of her detective work. Wow, wow, that's, that's awesome. Um, so it was 2022. Um, some people may say, you know, that was back in those days. You know, why is talking about Mr. Dabney in 2022 important today? Or is it not important today? Any of y'all want to answer? I'm going to jump in. <laughs> these, these stories are critically important because it really gives us um, all the different lenses needed to understand our past. Uh, people didn't spring up from nothing. I always remind people when they say, you know, that's the past. And I remind them, the first thing you do when you go to a doctor is fill out the form that asks you about your medical past because your past matters. It's written in your DNA. It's written in your proclivities towards certain health conditions. It's written into the way in which you live and exercise or don't exercise. It's in the way you eat foods. It's in every aspect of how you live and how you practice different things, different habits and so forth. And so history is that way. It's built into our cultural DNA into our nation's DNA, into the way in which the habits have formed, the habits of either lending or not lending to people of African descent, uh, the ways in which the communities were treated, the schools were treated, the expectations. It's written into every aspect. People have a tendency in this society, and especially right now in the Commonwealth of Virginia, to talk about whether our past will make someone uncomfortable. And I'm here to say, so what? 
Unless you have a secret to tell, you weren't alive during that period. And so don't take this personally. The past is, the, is our reality and is so incredibly important to know that past, to not walk your life in utter ignorance about what has impacted, directly impacted, and continues in some ways to directly impact people's lives. The reason, for example, that's, and I've encountered this with some of the stories when I wrote the book on the Underground Railroad in Virginia, there were people who knew nothing about their ancestors and how they escaped from slavery because many African Americans wanted to escape the pain. They didn't want to take that pain and transfer it to their children. And so they tucked those stories deep inside and didn't share with their children their struggles because they wanted their children to have a new sense of, of a beginning. And they didn't want to carry, they didn't want that pain to be transferred to their children. Now, personally, I think that was a mistake because I think pain is important to inform and to educate and to provide perspective. But for many African-Americans, they didn't want to transfer that pain because it was so intense, so deep and so traumatic. And so knowing about this past is critical in understanding that here you had this talented individual whose, whose, repu whose, whose recipes have been appropriated by many people and he has not gotten credit for it as well as so many other chefs, African-American chefs. Uh, I, my pet peeve is that we talk about African-American cuisine and we talk about Southern cuisine. And when we talk about Southern cuisine, we're usually talking about white chefs. And when, of course, we're talking about African-American cuisine, it's only black chefs. And I ask the question, what's the difference between Southern and African-American cuisine? There is no difference. It's all in who has appropriated what recipes. And so when we talk about the past, we really have to have a much better perspective on what has happened um, and, and why people uh, behave the way they do um, in order for us to work together as a society and move forward. Thank you so much for that answer. Any of our other panelists like to answer that question? Why is it important to talk about the life and legacy of Mr. Dabney in 2022. Well, I'll, well, I'll just. But I think it's. Um, I'm sorry. No, please, please, Jennifer. It's so important for uh, families, for people to counter common images they have of Black people, and I think that a lot of those images are, you know, perpetuated in different ways, and many of them are negative. But I also think that. Um, it's wonderful to be able to balance out the negativity with positive stories like the story of John Dabney. And I'm sure there are many other families with members like John Dabney that we aren't, you know, exploring right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I think to, to build on what, what Jenny is saying, we often have a really one dimensional concept of all sorts of people in the past. And of course, black Americans are no exception to that. And, that, and that's deeply unfortunate uh, to have such a simplistic thought as to what it meant to be Black in the United States in those years. And of course, it meant so many different things for so many different people. And I think the, the exceptional character of John Dabney's life also inspires us to think about how many other people may have had lives that, that were similar in some regard that, that we've lost sight of. Um, and, and so I think that that is important to talk about. I think also looking at the process by which we made the film, uh, it, it's important to think about what we can know and what we can't know and, and how separated we are from that past in 2022. When we learned, for example, of Wendell Dabney's um, autobi autobiographical sketch held at an archive in Cincinnati that uh, Dr. Nudie Alexander referred to a minute ago, uh, we called them and asked if we could get a copy. They were undergoing renovations. They said they could make a copy. They sent it over. And it was, as I recall, parts one and two of three. 
And uh, we followed up with them and, and asked about part three and they said, we don't, we don't have part three. So already there, there's this missing gap there, right? That, that we're aware of. And then John Dabney himself, because he didn't have the opportunity to learn to read and to write, never wrote down any of his thoughts and, and, and ideas in his own words, right? But Wendell, his son, had recorded some of them and, and they were in that autobiographical sketch. And so, of course, as you know, historians would, would rightly note, it's, it, that's not a primary source of somebody else's recollection of, of the original words, but it gets us as close as we can get. And it was very important to us in the film to put John Dabney's voice at the at the beginning. The first words that you hear are those of John Dabney as recalled by his son. Uh, and then the sort of narrative through line is Wendell Dabney's own words. And that we felt was the, the closest way that we could actually bring the real Dabneys uh, to tell you their own story. Um, but but that very effort shows the uh, the limits and the difficulties of, of telling this history, um, even in a family that had a comparative uh, degree of privilege and opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we also are, again, very fortunate to have Mr. Dabney's great great granddaughter, Elsa Hardy on. So Elsa, you know, you're a young person. It's 2022. Why is the life of your great great grandfather important to talk about today? Um, well, I feel like I would answer that question from the perspective of a person who's studying uh, African American history. As my mom mentioned, I'm enrolled in a PhD program in African American studies. And one of the things that I've noticed is that a lot of historical scholarship, particularly about Black people, tells the story of like far reaching, systemic, broad sweeping change. Um, and when we do tell the stories of individuals, there tend to be people like Frederick Douglass who you know, accomplished enormous things or were like obviously very spectacular in terms of their work and their legacy. And I've always gravitated towards stories about individual people, about people who maybe were noteworthy in their time, maybe were not. And um, when I learned about John Dabney for the first time with my mom um, and had the chance to speak to Hannah and Lance, I was really encouraged uh, by this story because I do think that we need to pay more attention to ordinary people, to people who, um, you know, like existed in their time, but their legacies have continued in these more subtle ways. Um, so for me, that's why John Dabney is important in, in 2022. Right. Thank you so much for the answer. And you know, to piggyback off what you all have said, the people in those times, they just did what they had to do. They didn't look at it as being something as great, but we do in 2022. Thank you all for those answers. Now, um, let's talk a little bit more about Mr. Dabney's life. You know, he was a resilient man. I mean, I'm sitting there thinking, oh my God, when I saw the movie and just just imagining what he went through as an enslaved individual and then having to you know go from that to trying to buy the freedom of his wife and to care for his family you know what lessons can we learn from mr dabney's life well i think it's important to recognize those daily efforts that people like John Dabney had to make to navigate such a, um, a stratified, hierarchical and racist society that he was running restaurants that were just a few hundred feet away from jails where people were being held um, before being um, sold and, and shipped away to, to places further south. Um, he and we know through Wendell how much he held his tongue when he had to, how much he um, knew that, you know, white people had certain expectations that he would have to meet in order to be a successful businessman and provide for his family. But at the same time, he and his wife named their first child after an abolitionist. They raised children who would go on to be um, advocates for civil rights. They would be teachers. They'd be a newspaper uh, founder. So you know, there, there's no uh, question as to whether he 
was, um, you know, very wise in every aspect of his daily life. And I think that's um, that kind of resilience is, is just one example of, of things that people were doing in every way, uh, in, in every situation during that time. Right, great. Anyone else like to answer that question? I'd like to weigh in on that. Um, you know, the, the life of um, people who had been formerly enslaved was very complicated. You know, Wendell Phillips reportedly, uh, and this is reportedly, was the father, the real father of Maggie Walker. Um, and he was uh, someone who visited Richmond. And so there were a number of people who probably got to know him a bit. Um, and so when we think about this world of Richmond that was that had a very deeply racist society that continued in such violent ways in the years following the Civil War, um, and yet it birthed um, people like Maggie Walker who became the first woman, not just African-American woman, the first woman to um, own a bank. She was, she, Maggie Walker, and I mentioned Sarah Garland Jones, who was the first African-American woman to be licensed to practice medicine in Virginia. Both of them were the classmates of Wendell um, Dabney. And of course, so they knew his father. They were all part of, of the Richmond Normal School. Um, and this was a school that was the principal of that school was Lizzie Knowles, who was a white Northern missionary who came down to, the, to Virginia and she worked in the schools and she inspired these individuals to do extraordinary things, to become professionals. So this was the world that, that John Dabney inhabited. He understood that it was a world filled with contradictions, filled with different ways that people um, had to navigate. Um, and he also understood that he had to keep his, his um, temperament uh, uh -huh. a certain way around whites um, so that as a businessman, uh, he could continue to thrive because there were banks in Richmond uh, that were very conservative and, but yeah, he had a good reputation with those banks and those banks were essential for the continuation and expansion of his businesses. So, he, you know, these, the story of John Dabney is really a story about how individuals navigated their world and, and his success really shows you how he knew how to even manipulate people's opinion of him. Um, in a positive way for him because of the constraints, the racial constraints that were there in society. Thank you, thank you so much. Anyone else like to answer? Okay, well, I do have one question too to add. So as I was looking at the film, it looked like Mr. Dabney and his family lived in a very prestigious area with, you know, white people who were very prestigious. You know, talk a little bit about that in reference to that, please. It, it is striking the centrality of that space uh, in Richmond. If you go there today and stand on that spot, uh, you're, you're a good baseball throw from the, the governor's mansion uh, at, from the Virginia State Capitol. I mean, it's, it's right there. Um, and, and indeed, though, the area has changed dramatically in, in terms of there's highways and a medical center and, and all sorts of uh, concrete things uh, there now. Um, it, it was and remains a, a place of great importance uh, to the city. And the fact that he and his wife bought a home there uh, is reflective of, of his status, of his, his station in Richmond at that time. It made sense that somebody like John Dabney would live there, uh, much in the way that you know, we continue to kind of look at addresses as having a sort of uh, reflection, rightly or wrongly, on people. Um, that, that is a, a reason why he, why he moved there, that that's a place that he felt uh, was appropriate for him and, and indeed um, may have been an effort to indicate to his clients 
um, what sort of uh, what sort of world he moved in, and thus that they could be comfortable hiring him, trusting him, working with him. Okay, great. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I wanted to add that there's a perception that our society has been residentially segregated uh, since the beginning, which is not true. This is a a, 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 a law that was really initiated in a lot of different Southern cities uh, around the turn of the 20th century in, in, in any time between maybe 1901, 1902 through about the 1920s. That's when you would really begin to see residential segregation imposed. And so in Richmond, you had a number of African-Americans who were professionals who lived all over the city while there was a concentration in the Jackson Ward they lived in many different places. Uh, you had George Boyd, who was one of the big builders um, uh, in Richmond, and he constructed houses in different places. But later on, you would see this residential segregation uh, emerge, and you would see African Americans pushed out of certain of the houses that they were in if they were in um, white dominated areas. You would also see the birth of suburban communities and that's where a lot of whites would start fleeing to those suburban communities that were exclusively white so it's not surprising that at that particular time in uh, the nation's history and in richmond's history that you would see prominent uh, and successful african americans living in very um, nice rich areas uh, it reflected their wealth as well great 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 thank you thank you thank you Anyone else want to answer? All righty. Well, to the filmmakers, I have a question. Uh, why did you choose Mr. Dabney's life for your film? And how do you choose, how did you choose the contributors of the work? And, you know, tell us a little bit about your work on this film. Sure, sure. Well, um, we were drawn to his story for a number of reasons. Uh, one was just how rare it is to see a depiction of someone who um, was enslaved and then who became free and um, truly really see them as a three-dimensional person. And we thought that we could kind of work towards uh, really recognizing that three-dimensionality in part because of that memoir that uh, his son wrote, how special it was that we could um, hear his voice, even though he had not um, been able, not had the opportunity to learn how to read or write himself. Um, and we have always been really drawn to family stories and to um, exploring legacy. Um, it's been a, a through line um, in a lot of our, our film work. And so knowing that um, the uh, festival organizers had found uh, Jenny and that their family um, had so many remarkable stories of their own, um, that really appealed. And so one of the first things we did was, was connect with, with Jenny and we went up to meet her and her family in Brooklyn and then visited her in Kentucky. And, um, you know, I think that helps uh, bring a story to life, a historical story to life in a way that um, just wouldn't really ring as true um, to, to people because we all have those family stories. So it's, it's a way to really inspire empathy um, among people to, to emphasize, you know, we all have our, our stories that have been passed down and, and what do they mean to us today? Um, and we also enjoyed the opportunity to um, explore the, the legacy of African-American food and, and uh, beverages. And as uh, Dr. Newby Alexander explained, so much of that is what we think of as American cuisine. So being able to film with uh, a gentleman here, Chauncey Jenkins, who um, was the, the gentleman who brought the, the mint julep to life. Um, you know, he's a successful entrepreneur and, and um, restaurateur here. And then we traveled down to South Carolina um, to meet, um, Kevin and he and learned about all of his successes in um, being a, a chef today. So it, it, through John Dabney's life, there were all these ways of exploring um, African-American family legacy, African-American food legacy. Um, and we thought it was just a, a very rich um, set of, of stories to explore. Okay, great. Thank you so much. 
Now, Jen, I'm going to ask you a question. So as we, you and I, we've been talking um, over the past couple of weeks and um, you really shared just how successful many people in your family are. And again, you know, do you think it came from, you know, Mr. Dabney's, um, you know, no matter what he's going to, you know, become successful, you know, where do you think those folks who, like you talked about, I believe your grandfather um, was a founder of a hospital. Is that correct here in yes. Virginia? Yes. Okay. Um, I do feel like, oh, I'm sorry. I do feel like um, there's something in the genes. I mean, mm -hmm. when we were talking about Wendell and um, the brother who played baseball, the musician, um, the school teacher, I feel like all of these careers have replicated themselves through the generations. And um, both my husband and my son are musicians. And my son was uh, just a student baseball player, but loved baseball. And the fact that I became a teacher, it just feels, and that we have that share, uh, share the connection with the horses, just feels so, uh, like where did that all come from? It must have come from Mr. Dad. And I also feel like, the way the stories are told about how he took care of his family and how he went out of his way to procure his wife's safety. That reminds me a little bit of how my dad behaved towards us and my family. And my dad didn't have as nearly as many accomplishments, but I feel like that was in his genes too. Okay, great, great. Alrighty, thank you so much. Now I do have a question for Dr. Nubi Alexander. You are a historian, and um, you know, how did you get involved in this film? Like, um, well, Hannah and Lance reached out to me, okay. um, and I I'm only assuming because of some of the work that I've done and the fact that I know Hannah's father very well, uh, who's a renowned historian and um, and so my thought is that uh, because of my work and, uh, and I, as you all can tell, I have a big mouth and I'm not afraid to use it, um, that they reached out to me for that. Um, I'm a very, very passionate advocate about understanding this history and incorporating this history into our overall understanding and narrative. Uh, but I'll let them speak to why they reached out to me. Okay, thank you. Well, one, one reason, uh, in addition to Dr. Neva Alexander's scholarship is, you know, it's, it's really special to us to find historians who care so deeply about making sure history is accessible and understandable to the public. And, you know, that's not always the case with historians that, you know, some are, are more focused on research and writing, um, but Dr. Neva Alexander has been really involved in, you um, you know, K through 12 education, how history is, is uh, taught there and standards and um, so many public history initiatives. So we knew that she would really understand why this story was so important to convey and, and to really dive into the complexities of it. So um, yeah, we're very lucky that she, she uh, lent her expertise to that. Thank you so much. Well, are there any questions in the audience for our panels members? Anyone have any questions? You can type them in the chat if you feel uncomfortable talking out loud. Yeah, I, I, have, a, I have a question in general. Uh, I, I saw that, that, that uh, Mr. Dabney had, uh, I don't know, eight, nine children. I was wondering, did the family, did they have a family reunions today to get, Sort of pull those folks together. Is that happening? Happened in the past, or is it planned? To, you know, did that ever happen? I'm just curious about connecting all those the family together. Well, Miss Hardy had to get off. Elsa, okay. do, you, do, do you know um, if about that question, Mr. Coleman asked? Yeah, uh, no. Unfortunately, nothing like that has ever happened. We did recently connect with another Dabney descendant last year. His wife. Um, got him one of those like DNA uh, kits. I don't know what which one, but um, he connected with my mom through that, and um, they were able to meet up in Kentucky when he was visiting with his family. And um, 
we've just slowly been learning about other members of the Dabney line, but so far it's just, it's just a one. So it would be a pretty small reunion. Mm. Okay. And also just to let you know, in this area, there's a whole bunch of Dabneys. I was telling your mother that I grew up with a whole bunch in the area I grew up in, King and Queen County, Virginia. So I was telling her I'm gonna try to connect you guys to them because there may be some relation um, there. Are there any other questions from the audience? I don't have a question, but I would encourage everyone to really watch uh, Hannah and Lance's film. I think it's a, an important film. It's, it's not only emotionally poignant, it draws you in, but it tells us such a rich story and it makes you want to know more. And I always say that the best presentations, the best artistic presentations, the best lectures are those who, that lead the audience wanting more. They want that story to continue over and over and over again. And so since Elsa is a part of the, uh, um, the intellectual world and and her, her desire to know more is clearly there. Uh, sounds Elsa like you are going to take this story and move it forward uh, in a way that is probably going to not only enrich yourself and your scholarship, uh, but enrich all of us to know more about the legacy of John Dabney. Totally agree, mm -hmm. totally agree. So I do have a question in the chat um, for Hannah and Lance. Can you tell us what projects you're working on now or in the near future? Sure, sure. Um, the most recent film that we premiered in 2021 was called How the Monuments Came Down. Uh, and it was a look at 160 years of black resistance to white supremacy in Richmond, which of course was the former capital of the Confederacy. And that resistance included resistance to Confederate monuments, which really came to a head, of course, in 2020. Uh, when they were ultimately removed from Richmond, first at the uh, at the doing and the demands of protesters, and then uh, eventually with uh, city officials kind of uh, complying with uh, with those demands for the remaining statues. Um, that process is still ongoing in the neighborhood where we live. Uh, there was a Confederate monument that was removed in 2020, but uh, until two weeks ago, a pillar and a plinth still stood there um, and that, that was just, just removed. So the sort of deconfederatization of, of Richmond is very much an ongoing process. And we looked at, at that long history, uh, a history in many ways Ways bookended by by the monuments, uh, who put them up, who took them down, uh, but demonstrating that what we are really seeing, if we look carefully and critically at the history of Confederate monuments here, and I'm sure it's the case in many communities, is a history of Black resistance to those monuments that's often uh, not been talked about or, or not well reflected by uh, stone tributes to to Confederates, um, and so that 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 was that was what that film was about, and it premiered on uh, PBS last year and, um, and was invited for a screening at the Smithsonian. And we're working on a project now that we can't talk about just yet, but it will be premiering later this year on the Smithsonian Channel and Paramount Plus um, that we've been uh, eagerly and um, uh, exhaustively working on over the last uh, nine or 10 months. Okay, great. Well, keep us, we'll definitely keep um, looking into your work and we really appreciate your work. and. Um, I do have a question from one of our students who asked, um, how long did it take for the whole film to be complete? The Dabney film? Yes, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. My memory is that we uh, filmed with the Hardy family in Brooklyn, which I'm pretty sure was our first filming for the project in the middle of June, 2017. And it premiered at that year's John Dabney dinner, which was in either November or December. I'm November. Say November. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, uh, it, it's it's not a, an impressive thing to say, but we were working on the film up until about thirty minutes before the premiere. So, um, oh wow! Uh, I, I would say it, it took from uh, June to November, <laughs> just barely. Uh, wow! So, so four months and pretty much a full time project. Not off the presses. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow, that's very impressionable. Um, another question is, are there any mementos from Mr. Dabney's life or his wife with children? Do any of y'all know that answer? 
Well, there's there's an interesting development on that actually because um, there had been uh, newspaper accounts of Mr. Dabney receiving a uh, a goblet from the city, um, applauding him for his work and uh, winning competitions to make the best cocktail against other um, bartenders from all over the East Coast. And this um, this goblet had been lost for for um, gosh, I guess 150 years and um, or about 100 years. And um, there had been many efforts to try to find it. And it was actually apparently just found um, last year and kind of reunited with um, one of the, the descendants. So we do have that goblet that is uh, inscribed to John Dabney. So that's a very special um, element of, of his legacy. Wow, that is awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> And, and when Hannah says we do have it, uh, we don't have it. Um, <laughs> right. The, the, the family has the it, family. and we as a community of, of learners are now aware that it exists, yeah. but uh, it's not hiding out in our house. So. <laughs> okay, great. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, do y'all have any closing remarks before we end this session um, to our audience? Dr. Nubia Alexander, what's your closing remarks for our Young, especially young people that's on here. I would say that this story is one of thousands, if not more than that, um, that are being created as we speak um, to tell this very rich history of uh, our nation's history, um, but especially here in Virginia. Um, and a lot of museums and libraries, as well as independent filmmakers are coming uh, together to put these stories together. So I would say, you know, start looking at YouTube and the internet uh, because they, they're, they're coming out with this and they're trying to make these stories accessible uh, to the general public. And uh, so really go out and, and, mm -hmm. and see what's out there. And you'll find that um, the richness and, and the I would say the duplication of these kinds of in incredible accounts uh, are all over the place. And, um, and each time it adds a little bit more information, you start to begin to see this jigsaw puzzle connection between all of them. Uh, and there are a lot of other stories that are being told. Um, Shadrach Minkins, for example, who escaped from Norfolk, um, who ended up in Montreal. There's a Montreal PBS group that's doing a documentary on his life uh, and wow. uncovering things about him that mm -hmm. people really didn't know. So this is the, the John Dabney story is really the beginning, hopefully of your journey to learn more about these incredible people who are part of uh, a system of oppression that, um, that didn't stop their incredible work. Great, thank you, thank you. Okay, Hannah and Lance, y'all have some closing words or any advice for the students? Uh, I would just say very briefly that I think the story and in many ways, even this program today reminds us about how this history is very alive, right? It's not just some relic in a cabinet somewhere. Uh, we've been honored in the last hour to be with two members of the Hardy family, two descendants of John Dabney. We're talking about a history that isn't just a long time ago. It, it is reflected even in this current moment uh, in this gathering. Um, it, it, it is a reminder, it could be a reminder to us that, that history is always, you know, that our present day is just kind of the end of a thread that goes way, way back. And we shouldn't look at history as somehow being fundamentally separated from our, our present day existence, but something that is absolutely woven into it, uh, whether we see it or not. And I just want to thank the Hardy family for, for trusting us and for uh, contributing their, their stories and perspectives to the film and to Dr. Nubi Alexander for um, lending her expertise. And thank you, Lorraine, for putting this together. And thank you all for joining us. Um, you know, we, we made this film a few years ago, and it's not one that we often get a chance to talk about, but it, it, it's very close to our hearts. And so it's always special um, to be able to, to share it and, and talk about it with others.
Well, thank you um, all for being here. And I just want to um, ask Elsa if you want to say something on behalf of her family. Yeah, I just want to um, thank you, Hannah and Lance, again, for um, uncovering so much of this history and sharing it with us. And thank you to the organizers of this event. Um, it's been a real honor. Thank you all so much. And I want to tell you, um, I have looked at everything that y'all have put together. The work is beautiful. And I've looked at some of your other films and I'm excited about this new piece that you're putting together. I'm real excited um, about that. And keep us in the loop. And if you ever need some extras, you know, you have some folks here on the, I think on the Zoom who would love to be um, extras. And um, actually this film had so many contributors. I mean, I wanted everybody to be here, but we know because of time we couldn't. Um, so again, thank you all for being here. If you have any questions, again, if you haven't seen the film, look at it. Um, I believe Hannah put it in the chat. So the website is there. And again, thank you all for coming and um, look forward to some more events um, with our filmmakers and our contributors and um, the Hardy family. Again, we will give you a special thanks. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.